Paper 110. Relation of Adjusters to Individual Mortals. The endowment of imperfect beings with freedom entails inevitable tragedy, and it is the nature of the perfect ancestral deity to universally and affectionately share these sufferings in loving companionship. As far as I am conversant with the affairs of a universe, I regard the love and devotion of a thought adjuster as the most truly divine affection in all creation. The love of the sons in their ministry to the races is superb, but the devotion of an adjuster to the individual is touchingly sublime, divinely fatherlike. The Paradise Father has apparently reserved this form of personal contact with his individual creatures as an exclusive creator prerogative, and there is nothing in all the universe of universes exactly comparable to the marvelous ministry of these impersonal entities that so fascinatingly indwell the children of the evolutionary planets. 1. Indwelling the Mortal Mind Adjusters should not be thought of as living in the material brains of human beings. They are not organic parts of the physical creatures of the realms. The thought adjuster may more properly be envisaged as indwelling the mortal mind of man rather than as existing within the confines of a single physical organ. And indirectly and unrecognized, the adjuster is constantly communicating with the human subject, especially during those sublime experiences of the worshipful contact of mind with spirit in the superconsciousness. I wish it were possible for me to help evolving mortals to achieve a better understanding and attain a fuller appreciation of the unselfish and superb work of the adjusters living within them, who are so devoutly faithful to the task of fostering man's spiritual welfare. These monitors are efficient ministers to the higher phases of men's minds. They are wise and experienced manipulators of the spiritual potential of the human intellect. These heavenly helpers are dedicated to the stupendous task of guiding you safely inward and upward to the celestial haven of happiness. These tireless toilers are consecrated to the future personification of the triumph of divine truth in your life everlasting. They are the watchful workers who pilot the God-conscious human mind away from the shoals of evil while expertly guiding the evolving soul of man toward the divine harbors of perfection on far distant and eternal shores. The adjusters are loving leaders, your safe and sure guides through the dark and uncertain mazes of your short earthly career. They are the patient teachers who so constantly urge their subjects forward in the paths of progressive perfection. They are the careful custodians of the sublime values of creature character. I wish you could love them more, cooperate with them more fully, and cherish them more affectionately. Although the divine indwellers are chiefly concerned with your spiritual preparation for the next stage of the never-ending existence, they are also deeply interested in your temporal welfare and in your real achievements on earth. They are delighted to contribute to your health, happiness, and true prosperity. They are not indifferent to your success in all matters of planetary advancement which are not inimical to your future life of eternal progress. Adjusters are interested in and concerned with your daily doings and the manifold details of your life, just to the extent that these are influential in the determination of your significant temporal choices and vital spiritual decisions and hence are factors in the solution of your problem of soul survival and eternal progress. The adjuster, while passive regarding purely temporal welfare, is divinely active concerning all the affairs of your eternal future. The adjuster remains with you in all disaster and through every sickness which does not wholly destroy the mentality. But how unkind knowingly to defile or otherwise deliberately to pollute the physical body, which must serve as the earthly tabernacle of this marvelous gift from God. All physical poisons greatly retard the efforts of the adjuster to exalt the material mind, while the mental poisons of fear, anger, envy, jealousy, suspicion, and intolerance likewise tremendously interfere with the spiritual progress of the evolving soul. Today you are passing through the period of the courtship of your adjuster, and if you only prove faithful to the trust reposed in you by the divine spirit who seeks your mind and soul in eternal union, 
there will eventually ensue that morancha oneness, that supernal harmony, that cosmic coordination, that divine attunement, that celestial fusion, that never-ending blending of identity, that oneness of being, which is so perfect and final that even the most experienced personalities can never segregate or recognize as separate identities the fusion partners, mortal man and divine adjuster. 2. Adjusters and Human Will When thought adjusters indwell human minds, they bring with them the model careers, the ideal lives, as determined and foreordained by themselves and the personalized adjusters of Divinington, which have been certified by the personalized adjuster of Urantia. Thus they begin work with a definite and predetermined plan for the intellectual and spiritual development of their human subjects. But it is not incumbent upon any human being to accept this plan. You are all subjects of predestination, but it is not foreordained that you must accept this divine predestination. You are at full liberty to reject any part or all of the Thought Adjuster's program. It is their mission to effect such mind changes and to make such spiritual adjustments as you may willingly and intelligently authorize, to the end that they may gain more influence over the personality directionization. But under no circumstances do these divine monitors ever take advantage of you or in any way arbitrarily influence you in your choices and decisions. The adjusters respect your sovereignty of personality. They are always subservient to your will. They are persistent, ingenious, and perfect in their methods of work, but they never do violence to the volitional selfhood of their hosts. No human being will ever be spiritualized by a divine monitor against his will. Survival is a gift of the gods which must be desired by the creatures of time. In the final analysis, Whatever the adjuster has succeeded in doing for you, the records will show that the transformation has been accomplished with your cooperative consent. You will have been a willing partner with the adjuster in the attainment of every step of the tremendous transformation of the ascension career. The adjuster is not trying to control your thinking as such, but rather to spiritualize it, to eternalize it. Neither angels nor adjusters are devoted directly to influencing human thought. That is your exclusive personality prerogative. The adjusters are dedicated to improving, modifying, adjusting, and coordinating your thinking processes. But more especially and specifically, they are devoted to the work of building up spiritual counterparts of your careers, morancha transcripts of your true advancing selves, for survival purposes. Adjusters work in the spheres of the higher levels of the human mind, unceasingly seeking to produce Marancha duplicates of every concept of the mortal intellect. There are, therefore, two realities which impinge upon and are centered in the human mind circuits. One, a mortal self, evolved from the original plans of the life carriers the other an immortal entity from the high spheres of Divinington, an indwelling gift from God. But the mortal self is also a personal self. It has personality. You as a personal creature have mind and will. The adjuster as a pre-personal creature has pre-mind and pre-will. If you so fully conform to the adjuster's mind that you see eye to eye, then your minds become one, and you receive the reinforcement of the adjuster's mind. Subsequently, if your will orders and enforces the execution of the decisions of this new or combined mind, the adjuster's pre-personal will attains to personality expression through your decision. And as far as that particular project is concerned, you and the adjuster are one. Your mind has attained to divinity attunement, and the adjuster's will has achieved personality expression. To the extent that this identity is realized, you are mentally approaching the Morancha order of existence. Morancha mind is a term signifying the substance and sum total of the cooperating minds of diversely material and spiritual natures. Morancha intellect, therefore, connotes a dual mind in the local universe dominated by one will. 
and with mortals this is a will, human in origin, which is becoming divine through man's identification of the human mind with the mindedness of God. 3. Cooperation with the Adjuster Adjusters are playing the sacred and superb game of the ages. They are engaged in one of the supreme adventures of time in space. And how happy they are when your cooperation permits them to lend assistance in your short struggles of time as they continue to prosecute their larger tasks of eternity. But usually when your adjuster attempts to communicate with you, the message is lost in the material currents of the energy streams of human mind. Only occasionally do you catch an echo, a faint and distant echo, of the divine voice. The success of your adjuster in the enterprise of piloting you through the mortal life and bringing about your survival depends not so much on the theories of your beliefs as upon your decisions, determinations, and steadfast faith. All these movements of personality growth become powerful influences aiding in your advancement because they help you to cooperate with the adjuster. They assist you in ceasing to resist. Thought adjusters succeed or apparently fail in their terrestrial undertakings just in so far as mortals succeed or fail to cooperate with the scheme whereby they are to be advanced along the ascending path of perfection attainment. The secret of survival is wrapped up in the supreme human desire to be godlike and in the associated willingness to do and be any and all things which are essential to the final attainment of that overmastering desire. When we speak of an adjuster's success or failure, we are speaking in terms of human survival. Adjusters never fail. They are of the divine essence, and they always emerge triumphant in each of their undertakings. I cannot but observe that so many of you spend so much time and thought on mere trifles of living while you almost wholly overlook the more essential realities of everlasting import, those very accomplishments which are concerned with the development of a more harmonious working agreement between you and your adjusters. The great goal of human existence is to attune to the divinity of the indwelling adjuster, the great achievement of mortal life, is the attainment of a true and understanding consecration to the eternal aims of the Divine Spirit who waits and works within your mind. But a devoted and determined effort to realize eternal destiny is wholly compatible with a light-hearted and joyous life and with a successful and honorable career on earth. Cooperation with the Thought Adjuster does not entail self-torture, mock piety, or hypocritical and ostentatious self-abasement. The ideal life is one of loving service rather than an existence of fearful apprehension. Confusion, being puzzled, even sometimes discouraged and distracted, does not necessarily signify resistance to the leadings of the indwelling adjuster. Such attitudes may sometimes connote lack of active cooperation with the divine monitor and may, therefore, somewhat delay spiritual progress. But such intellectual-emotional difficulties do not in the least interfere with the certain survival of the God-knowing soul. Ignorance alone can never prevent survival. Neither can confusional doubts nor fearful uncertainty. Only conscious resistance to the adjuster's leading can prevent the survival of the evolving immortal soul. You must not regard cooperation with your adjuster as a particularly conscious process, for it is not. But your motives and your decisions, your faithful determinations and your supreme desires do constitute real and effective cooperation. You can consciously augment adjuster harmony by 1. Choosing to respond to divine leading, sincerely basing the human life on the highest consciousness of truth beauty, and goodness, and then coordinating these qualities of divinity through wisdom, worship, faith, and love. 2. Loving God and desiring to be like Him, genuine recognition of the divine fatherhood, and loving worship of the heavenly parent. 3. 
loving man and sincerely desiring to serve him. Wholehearted recognition of the brotherhood of man, coupled with an intelligent and wise affection for each of your fellow mortals. 4. Joyful acceptance of cosmic citizenship, honest recognition of your progressive obligations to the Supreme Being, awareness of the interdependence of evolutionary man and evolving deity. This is the birth of cosmic morality and the dawning realization of universal duty. 4. The adjusters work in the mind. Adjusters are able to receive the continuous stream of cosmic intelligence coming in over the master circuits of time and space. They are in full touch with the spirit intelligence and energy of the universes. But these mighty indwellers are unable to transmit very much of this wealth of wisdom and truth to the minds of their mortal subjects because of the lack of commonness of nature and the absence of responsive recognition. The thought adjuster is engaged in a constant effort so to spiritualize your mind as to evolve your morancha soul. But you yourself are mostly unconscious of this inner ministry. You are quite incapable of distinguishing the product of your own material intellect from that of the conjoint activities of your soul and the adjuster. Certain abrupt presentations of thoughts, conclusions, and other pictures of mind are sometimes the direct or indirect work of the adjuster, but far more often they are the sudden emergence into consciousness of ideas which have been grouping themselves together in the submerged mental levels, natural and everyday occurrences of normal and ordinary psychic function inherent in the circuits of the evolving animal mind. In contrast with these subconscious emanations, the revelations of the adjuster appear through the realms of the superconscious. Trust all matters of mind beyond the dead level of consciousness to the custody of the adjusters. In due time, if not in this world, then on the mansion world, they will give good account of their stewardship, and eventually will they bring forth those meanings and values entrusted to their care and keeping. They will resurrect every worthy treasure of the mortal mind if you survive. There exists a vast gulf between the human and the divine, between man and God. The Urantia races are so largely electrically and chemically controlled, so highly animal-like in their common behavior, so emotional in their ordinary reactions, that it becomes exceedingly difficult for the monitors to guide and direct them. You are so devoid of courageous decisions and consecrated cooperation that your indwelling adjusters find it next to impossible to communicate directly with the human mind. Even when they do find it possible to flash a gleam of new truth to the evolving mortal soul, this spiritual revelation often so blinds the creature as to precipitate a convulsion of fanaticism or to initiate some other intellectual upheaval which results disastrously. Many a new religion and strange ism has arisen from the aborted, imperfect, misunderstood, and garbled communications of the thought adjusters. For many thousands of years, so the records of Jerusalem show, in each generation there have lived fewer and fewer beings who could function safely with self-acting adjusters. This is an alarming picture, and the supervising personalities of Satania look with favor upon the proposals of some of your more immediate planetary supervisors who advocate the inauguration of measures designed to foster and conserve the higher spiritual types of the Arantia races. 5. Erroneous Concepts of Adjuster Guidance Do not confuse and confound the mission and influence of the adjuster with what is commonly called conscience. They are not directly related. Conscience is a human and purely psychic reaction. It is not to be despised, but it is hardly the voice of God to the soul, which indeed the adjusters would be, if such a voice could be heard. Conscience rightly admonishes you to do right, but the adjuster, in addition, endeavors to tell you what truly is right, that is, when and as you are able to perceive the monitor's leading. Man's dream experiences, that disordered and disconnected parade of the uncoordinated sleeping mind, present adequate proof of the failure of the adjusters to harmonize and associate the divergent factors of the mind of man. The adjusters simply cannot, in a single lifetime, 
arbitrarily coordinate and synchronize two such unlike and diverse types of thinking as the human and the divine. When they do, as they sometimes have, such souls are translated directly to the mansion worlds without the necessity of passing through the experience of death. During the slumber season, the adjuster attempts to achieve only that which the will of the indwelt personality has previously fully approved by the decisions and choosings which were made during times of fully wakeful consciousness and which have thereby become lodged in the realms of the supermind, the liaison domain of human and divine interrelationship. While their mortal hosts are asleep, the adjusters try to register their creations in the higher levels of the material mind, and some of your grotesque dreams indicate their failure to make efficient contact. The absurdities of dream life not only testify to pressure of unexpressed emotions, but also bear witness to the horrible distortion of the representations of the spiritual concepts presented by the adjusters. Your own passions, urges, and other innate tendencies translate themselves into the picture and substitute their unexpressed desires for the divine messages which the indwellers are endeavoring to put into the psychic records during unconscious sleep. It is extremely dangerous to postulate as to the adjuster content of the dream life. The adjusters do work during sleep, but your ordinary dream experiences are purely physiologic and psychologic phenomena. Likewise, it is hazardous to attempt the differentiation of the adjuster's concept registry from the more or less continuous and conscious reception of the dictations of mortal conscience. These are problems which will have to be solved through individual discrimination and personal decision. But a human being would do better to err in rejecting an adjuster's expression through believing it to be a purely human experience than to blunder into exalting a reaction of the mortal mind to the sphere of divine dignity. Remember, the influence of a thought adjuster is for the most part, though not wholly, a superconscious experience. In varying degrees and increasingly as you ascend the psychic circle, sometimes directly, but more often indirectly, you do communicate with your adjusters. But it is dangerous to entertain the idea that every new concept originating in the human mind is the dictation of the adjuster. More often, in beings of your order, that which you accept as the adjuster's voice is in reality the emanation of your own intellect. This is dangerous ground, and every human being must settle these problems for himself in accordance with his natural human wisdom and superhuman insight. The adjuster of the human being through whom this communication is being made enjoys such a wide scope of activity chiefly because of this human's almost complete indifference to any outward manifestations of the adjuster's inner presence. It is indeed fortunate that he remains consciously quite unconcerned about the entire procedure. He holds one of the highly experienced adjusters of his day and generation and yet his passive reaction to and inactive concern toward the phenomena associated with the presence in his mind of this versatile adjuster is pronounced by the guardian of destiny to be a rare and fortuitous reaction. And all this constitutes a favorable coordination of influences, favorable both to the adjuster in the higher sphere of action and to the human partner from the standpoints of health, efficiency, and tranquility. 6. The Seven Psychic Circles The sum total of personality realization on a material world is contained within the successive conquest of the seven psychic circles of mortal potentiality. Entrance upon the seventh circle marks the beginning of true human personality function. Completion of the first circle denotes the relative maturity of the mortal being, though the traversal of the seven circles of cosmic growth does not equal fusion with the adjuster, the mastery of these circles marks the attainment of those steps which are preliminary to adjuster fusion. The adjuster is your equal partner in the attainment of the seven circles, the achievement of comparative mortal maturity. The adjuster ascends the circles with you from the seventh to the first, but progresses to the status of supremacy and self-activity 
quite independent of the active cooperation of the mortal mind. The psychic circles are not exclusively intellectual, neither are they wholly morontial. They have to do with personality status, mind attainment, soul growth, and a juster attunement. The successful traversal of these levels demands the harmonious functioning of the entire personality, not merely of some one phase thereof. The growth of the parts does not equal the true maturation of the whole. The parts really grow in proportion to the expansion of the entire self, the whole self, material, intellectual, and spiritual. When the development of the intellectual nature proceeds faster than that of the spiritual, such a situation renders communication with the thought adjuster both difficult and dangerous. Likewise, over-spiritual development tends to produce a fanatical and perverted interpretation of the spirit leadings of the divine indweller. Lack of spiritual capacity makes it very difficult to transmit to such a material intellect the spiritual truths resident in the higher superconsciousness. It is to the mind of perfect poise, housed in a body of clean habits, stabilized neural energies and balanced chemical function, when the physical, mental, and spiritual powers are in triune harmony of development, that a maximum of light and truth can be imparted with a minimum of temporal danger or risk to the real welfare of such a being. By such a balanced growth does man ascend the circles of planetary progression one by one, from the seventh to the first. The adjusters are always near you and of you, but rarely can they speak directly as another being to you. Circle by circle, your intellectual decisions, moral choosings, and spiritual development add to the ability of the adjuster to function in your mind. Circle by circle, you thereby ascend from the lower stages of adjuster association and mind attunement, so that the adjuster is increasingly enabled to register his picturizations of destiny with augmenting vividness and conviction upon the evolving consciousness of this God-seeking mind-soul. Every decision you make either impedes or facilitates the function of the adjuster. Likewise do these very decisions determine your advancement in the circles of human achievement. It is true that the supremacy of a decision, its crisis relationship, has a great deal to do with its circle-making influence. Nevertheless, numbers of decisions, frequent repetitions, persistent repetitions, are also essential to the habit-forming certainty of such reactions. It is difficult precisely to define the seven levels of human progression for the reason that these levels are personal. They are variable for each individual and are apparently determined by the growth capacity of each human being. The conquest of these levels of cosmic evolution is reflected in three ways. 1. Adjuster attunement. The spiritizing mind nears the adjuster presence proportional to circle attainment. 2. Soul evolution. The emergence of the Morancha soul indicates the extent and depth of circle mastery. 3. Personality reality. The degree of selfhood reality is directly determined by circle conquest. Persons become more real as they ascend from the seventh to the first level of mortal existence. As the circles are traversed, the child of material evolution is growing into the mature human of immortal potentiality. The shadowy reality of the embryonic nature of a seventh circler is giving way to the clearer manifestation of the emerging Morancha nature of a local universe citizen. While it is impossible precisely to define the seven levels or psychic circles of human growth, it is permissible to suggest the minimum and maximum limits of these stages of maturity realization. The seventh circle. This level is entered when human beings develop the powers of personal choice, individual decision, moral responsibility, and the capacity for the attainment of spiritual individuality. This signifies the united function of the seven adjutant mind spirits under the direction of the spirit of wisdom, the encircatment of the mortal creature in the influence of the Holy Spirit, 
and, on Urantia, the first functioning of the spirit of truth, together with the reception of a thought adjuster in the mortal mind. Entrance upon the seventh circle constitutes a mortal creature, a truly potential citizen of the local universe. The third circle. The adjuster's work is much more effective after the human ascender attains the third circle and receives a personal seraphic guardian of destiny. While there is no apparent concert of effort between the adjuster and the seraphic guardian, nonetheless there is to be observed an unmistakable improvement in all phases of cosmic achievement and spiritual development subsequent to the assignment of the personal seraphic attendant. When the third circle is attained, the adjuster endeavors to morontiaize the mind of man during the remainder of the mortal lifespan, to make the remaining circles and achieve the final stage of the divine human association before natural death dissolves the unique partnership. The First Circle The adjuster cannot ordinarily speak directly and immediately with you until you attain the first and final circle of progressive mortal achievement. This level represents the highest possible realization of mind-adjuster relationship in the human experience prior to the liberation of the evolving Morantia soul from the habiliments of the material body. Concerning mind, emotions, and cosmic insight, this achievement of the first psychic circle is the nearest possible approach of material mind and spirit adjuster in human experience. Perhaps these psychic circles of mortal progression would be better denominated cosmic levels. Actual meaning grasps and value realizations of progressive approach to the Morancha consciousness of initial relationship of the evolutionary soul with the emerging supreme being. And it is this very relationship that makes it forever impossible fully to explain the significance of the cosmic circles to the material mind. These circle attainments are only relatively related to God consciousness. A seventh or sixth circler can be almost as truly God-knowing, sonship conscious, as a second or first circler. But such lower circle beings are far less conscious of experiential relation to the supreme being, universe citizenship. The attainment of these cosmic circles will become a part of the ascender's experience on the mansion worlds if they fail of such achievement before natural death. The motivation of faith makes experiential the full realization of man's sonship with God. But action, completion of decisions, is essential to the evolutionary attainment of consciousness of progressive kinship with the cosmic actuality of the Supreme Being. Faith transmutes potentials to actuals in the spiritual world, but potentials become actuals in the finite realms of the Supreme only by and through the realization of choice experience. But choosing to do the will of God joins spiritual faith to material decisions in personality action, and thus supplies a divine and spiritual fulcrum for the more effective functioning of the human and material leverage of God hunger. Such a wise coordination of material and spiritual forces greatly augments both cosmic realization of the Supreme and Morancha comprehension of the Paradise deities. The mastery of the cosmic circles is related to the quantitative growth of the Morancha soul, the comprehension of supreme meanings, but the qualitative status of this immortal soul is wholly dependent on the grasp of living faith upon the paradise potential fact value that mortal man is a son of the eternal God. Therefore does a seventh circler go on to the mansion world to attain further quantitative realization of cosmic growth, just as does a second or even a first circler. There is only an indirect relation between cosmic circle attainment an actual spiritual religious experience. Such attainments are reciprocal and therefore mutually beneficial. Purely spiritual development may have little to do with planetary material prosperity, but circle attainment always augments the potential of human success and mortal achievement. From the seventh to the third circle, 
there occurs increased and unified action of the seven adjutant mind spirits in the task of weaning the mortal mind from its dependence on the realities of the material life mechanisms preparatory to increased introduction to Marantia levels of experience. From the third circle onward, the adjutant influence progressively diminishes. The seven circles embrace mortal experience extending from the highest purely animal level to the lowest actual contactual Marantia level of self-consciousness as a personality experience. The mastery of the first cosmic circle signalizes the attainment of pre-Marantia mortal maturity and marks the termination of the conjoint ministry of the adjutant mind spirits as an exclusive influence of mind action in the human personality. Beyond the first circle, mind becomes increasingly akin to the intelligence of the Marantia stage of evolution, the conjoined ministry of the cosmic mind and the super-adjutant endowment of the creative spirit of a local universe. The great days in the individual careers of adjusters are, first, when the human subject breaks through into the third psychic circle, thus ensuring the monitor's self-activity and increased range of function, provided the indweller was not already self-acting. Then, when the human partner attains the first psychic circle, and they are thereby enabled to intercommunicate, at least to some degree. And last, when they are finally and eternally fused. 7. The Attainment of Immortality The achievement of the seven cosmic circles does not equal a juster fusion. There are many mortals living on Urantia who have attained their circles, but fusion depends on yet other greater and more sublime spiritual achievements upon the attainment of a final and complete attunement of the mortal will with the will of God as it is resident in the thought adjuster. When a human being has completed the circles of cosmic achievement, and further, when the final choosing of the mortal will permits the adjuster to complete the association of human identity with the morontial soul during evolutionary and physical life, then do such consummated liaisons of soul and adjuster go on independently to the mansion world. And there is issued the mandate from Uversa, which provides for the immediate fusion of the adjuster and the morontial soul. This fusion during physical life instantly consumes the material body. The human beings who might witness such a spectacle would only observe the translating mortal disappear in chariots of fire. Most adjusters who have translated their subjects from Urantia were highly experienced and of record as previous indwellers of numerous mortals on other spheres. Remember, adjusters gain valuable indwelling experience on planets of the lone order. It does not follow that adjusters only gain experience for advanced work in those mortal subjects who fail to survive. Subsequent to mortal fusion, the adjusters share your destiny and experience. They are you. After the fusion of the immortal Marantia soul and the associated adjuster, all of the experience and all of the values of the one eventually become the possession of the other, so that the two are actually one entity. In a certain sense, this new being is of the eternal past as well as for the eternal future. All that was once human in the surviving soul and all that is experientially divine in the adjuster now become the actual possession of the new and ever-ascending universe personality. But on each universe level, the adjuster can endow the new creature only with those attributes which are meaningful and of value on that level. An absolute oneness with the divine monitor, a complete exhaustion of the endowment of an adjuster, can only be achieved in eternity subsequent to the final attainment of the Universal Father, the Father of Spirits, ever the source of these divine gifts. When the evolving soul and the divine adjuster are finally and eternally fused, each gains all of the experienceable qualities of the other. This coordinate personality possesses all of the experiential memory of survival once held by the ancestral mortal mind and then resident in the Marantia soul, 
and in addition thereto, this potential finaliter embraces all the experiential memory of the adjuster throughout the mortal indwellings of all time. But it will require an eternity of the future for an adjuster ever completely to endow the personality partnership with the meanings and values which the divine monitor carries forward from the eternity of the past. But with the vast majority of Urantians, the adjuster must patiently await the arrival of death deliverance, must await the liberation of the emerging soul from the well-nigh complete domination of the energy patterns and chemical forces inherent in your material order of existence. The chief difficulty you experience in contacting with your adjusters consists in this very inherent material nature. So few mortals are real thinkers. You do not spiritually develop and discipline your minds to the point of favorable liaison with the divine adjusters. The ear of the human mind is almost deaf to the spiritual pleas which the adjuster translates from the manifold messages of the universal broadcasts of love proceeding from the Father of Mercies. The adjuster finds it almost impossible to register these inspiring spirit leadings in an animal mind so completely dominated by the chemical and electrical forces inherent in your physical natures. Adjusters rejoice to make contact with the mortal mind, but they must be patient through the long years of silent sojourn during which they are unable to break through animal resistance and directly communicate with you. The higher the thought adjusters ascend in the scale of service, the more efficient they become. But never can they greet you in the flesh with the same full, sympathetic, and expressionful affection as they will when you discern them mind to mind on the mansion worlds. During mortal life, the material body and mind separate you from your adjuster and prevent free communication. Subsequent to death, after the eternal fusion, you and the adjuster are one. You are not distinguishable as separate beings. And thus there exists no need for communication as you would understand it. While the voice of the adjuster is ever within you, most of you will hear it seldom during a lifetime. Human beings below the third and second circles of attainment rarely hear the adjuster's direct voice except in moments of supreme desire, in a supreme situation, and consequent upon a supreme decision. During the making and breaking of a contact between the mortal mind of a destiny reservist and the planetary supervisors, sometimes the indwelling adjuster is so situated that it becomes possible to transmit a message to the mortal partner. Not long since on Urantia, such a message was transmitted by a self-acting adjuster to the human associate a member of the Reserve Corps of Destiny. This message was introduced by these words, And now, without injury or jeopardy to the subject of my solicitous devotion, and without intent to over-chastise or discourage, for me make record of this my plea to him. Then followed a beautifully touching and appealing admonition. Among other things, the adjuster pleaded, that he more faithfully give me his sincere cooperation, more cheerfully endure the tasks of my emplacement, more faithfully carry out the program of my arrangement, more patiently go through the trials of my selection, more persistently and cheerfully tread the path of my choosing, more humbly receive credit that may accrue as a result of my ceaseless endeavors. Thus transmit my admonition, to the man of my indwelling. Upon him I bestow the supreme devotion and affection of a divine spirit, and say further to my beloved subject that I will function with wisdom and power until the very end, until the last earth struggle is over. I will be true to my personality trust. And I exhort him to survival not to disappoint me, not to deprive me of the reward of my patient and intense struggle. On the human will, our achievement of personality depends. Circle by circle, I have patiently ascended this human mind, and I have testimony that I am meeting the approval of the chief of my kind. Circle by circle, I am passing on to judgment. I await with pleasure 
and without apprehension the roll call of destiny. I am prepared to submit all to the tribunals of the Ancients of Days. Presented by a solitary messenger of Orvantan.